This will be part one of my lecture on Blackfoot phonology for the lunar cycle of Sa'akisum, which is the duck moon. This is not called Sa'akisum for the reason that the ducks return, but for the reason that they are reproducing during this period, or they start to reproduce during this period. One thing that always happens during the duck moon is you always have the equinox and subsequently um, the full moon after the equinox which brings the eggs and so you can see here as I'm speaking it's 2015 and on the written um, calendar representation I have at the bottom of this slide 2015 was not that much different from 2012 when I first designed this slide um, in fact, the full moon on, in 2012 was on the 6th of April, and the full moon today, it, this year in 2015 was on the 4th of April. So it wasn't that far off, but it's not always that aligned year after year. Um, sometimes the moon starts much earlier in March, and it uh, just happens that this time and in 2012, it started later in March. Uh, but in any case, you always have um, the equinox and the full moon. And then the Sunday that follows the full moon is Easter. And um, this is important. Like I said, Sa'akisum is named because the waterfowl are reproducing. and Or they start their reproducing. And so this was a very important time in the past. For those who don't understand, the calendar system I've laid out here on the bottom of the slide, um, it was actually invented by the gentleman on the top hand right in this image, Stomach Si Sapo Bullplume, who was a Iachkimi, a beaver bundle caretaker at the turn of the century in, in Bikani, in Brocket. And uh, he was trying to communicate the old blackfoot beaver bundle uh, stick count system to some of the clergy there, uh, some of the priests. And so he tried to represent it on paper and I basically um, copied the way that he was representing it. I've thrown in uh, the symbol for the full moon which he never used but otherwise this is how he would represent it with a block of sticks at the beginning of the moon representing the time that the moon was disappeared then the first crescent, and then each night after that being a line. And um, those little cross symbols representing Sundays so that he could um, correlate it to the Gregorian calendar for the purposes of communicating with the priest. But it is important to understand and appreciate that Sa'aki Sum is not the month of March as people often represent it as um, in various calendars that have been blackfootized. Uh, a lot of times this term Sa'akisum is just grafted over the regular Gregorian month of March and that's really not what it is. Uh, it's important to know and to not only know but to feel and to live these lunar cycles um, to be aware of them from the beginning from the first crescent to the last. And that time in between when the moon has disappeared is when you do Kisomansk uh, Seasts, the, the moon songs, and you pray about um, what's going to be forthcoming in that next cycle. So, Sa'akisum is a very important time. Um, it's certainly, you know, personally, it's very important for myself and. Uh, my wife, Adrian, this was the time when we first began to learn Blackfoot phonology ourselves. Um, and it was very important in the past because this is when the winter famine is broken by the advent of new food in the form of waterfowl eggs. Now here at Spopikimi, which is my
primary study site and has been for about eight years now. Um, you can see that the waters at the beginning of Sa'aki some uh, start melting if they're still freezing. And here we got about a half a melt going on. Similarly, along the Old Man and St. Mary's rivers near my house, the waters are ice free by this time. And this is the cue for the Opspinny, the Canada geese, to begin their mating. Um, already through Pitaki, some we would have seen these geese starting to pair off and begin to claim, lay claim to uh, particular islands, usually, where they want to um, situate their nests. If not islands, at least nest sites, uh, the couples would start start claiming. A lot of times you'll see a couple with a third member, and that could very well be their gosling from the previous year. As things get underway, that, that gosling will get chased off, he'll get pushed away, um, and it'll just be the goose and her gander. You know that things are getting serious when you see this behavior. This is a goose who is trying to hide, who's trying to, you know, this is literally laying low in the water, trying to um, be concealed. And it's very likely that the reason she's trying to be concealed is either because there's a, um, there's a gander nearby who's not her husband and she doesn't want to be mated by him. Um, but often, more often, that she has eggs concealed nearby and she doesn't want um, anybody to notice her. Geese are very conspicuous species. They're built, their bodies are built for the tundra. Um, and they stick out like sore thumbs um, if, if they're not hidden. And they can be very, relatively um, camouflaged in certain situations, but for the most part, they, they stick out. So you may see this behavior. You're certainly going to see a lot of aggression going on um, as the eggs are being laid and as the nest um, sites are being defended. You may see this behavior, which is the actual mating of the, of the geese. Um, first time I saw this, I thought <laughs> this gander is trying to drown this other gander. But uh, in fact, this is the, the geese mating. Um, you will see something similar where ganders are fighting. But when they're doing that, um, the gander on top will be biting the other one fiercely. Uh, won't be like this. And then around the time of the full moon, which is basically the hallmark for Easter, you'll get your first geese sitting on nests. And this is a goose who's uh, actually taken a uh, muskrat lodge and piled some extra reeds, cattail reeds, um, on top of it. Um, or those might be bulrush reeds. And is using that as a as a nest island, kind of a homemade nest island. Um, so when we think about Easter, you know, Easter is obviously something that comes from Europe, from the European tradition. Um, it has pagan associations in Germany and such. Uh, but the the real celebration of this time is you know, circles the globe. It's all over the Northern Hemisphere. And we had our own version, which is the opening of the beaver bundle at the end of winter. Um, that would be the big celebration uh, that includes the eggs. Um, you know, in, in Germany, you have the Easter egg hunt, or you would have had the Easter egg hunt, and that's the part of the ceremony that's been commodified and um, you know changed into something very kind of Disney-ish for children to go hunt plastic eggs or home colored eggs and this kind of a thing inside the house or what have you. Uh, in reality this is the time 
you know, Easter Day, you could go actual Easter egg hunting, and you would be successful uh, if you knew what you were doing in finding eggs. Um, so this was, and this was so celebrated, not because of like, because of fertility, um, certainly not because of an association with any resurrection, you know, <laughs> although both of those are symbolic, right? A resurrection of life, the fertility that brings new life. Yes, but, you know, those, and they're, I'm not saying they're not important aspects, but the key, the real significance is much more mundane and that is that people are starving at the end of winter like literally starving and the eggs are the first new food to become available and that's a big deal um, not for symbolic reasons but just for very grounded down-to-earth um, difference between starvation and survival and so uh, of course it was celebrated so this is one of the kind of goose nests you'll you'll find out there um, the ops beneath which means by the way white jaw or white cheek that blackfoot name for the geese ops beneath white jaw or white cheek um, the ops will sometimes use these muskrat lodges or piles of reeds that they construct themselves to makeshift islands of this sort. They might find peninsula type areas where they are surrounded on two or three sides by water and if you know that's all that's available that's what will be used. Um, again the, the they do stick out and so they're at an extreme disadvantage when it comes to um, guarding their nests against uh, especially land-borne mammals um, like coyotes for instance what is a goose to do if a coyote comes up upon her and she's not on an island comes upon her nest she's not gonna win that fight and uh, the coyote's gonna get the eggs I mean the nine times out of ten or more then nine times out of ten, I'd say she's not going to win that fight. So choosing islands is imperative. But everyone, and you'll see as we go through uh, the summer with this course, every one of the waterfowl has a different kind of strategy um, to use for both for protecting its nest and in time with the um, with the climate of the season. So the geese are going to use islands because they themselves are so conspicuous. In order to effectively do that, they have to be the earliest to nest. They need to nest before we have uh, what's called uh, misamp sota, the long rains, when we get our monsoons and we get major flooding um, that cover up the islands potentially and that flood the, the uh, floodplains of the rivers. They need to have their incubation period done before that happens. And so they need to get in early. And um, their timing basically is that they're going to be cashing eggs for the week before the full moon and going into the full moon after the equinox. And then around the time of the full moon, the first nests are going to be being sat on. And in fact, um, I was just down at Shpopikimi uh, yesterday morning and saw that the first nests are being sat on and that was the day after Easter so I highly suspect that at least some of those nests were being sat on for the first time on Easter morning because I've been there the day before Easter and they weren't being sat on so the timing is uh, still holds um, for that ritual um, and it's not just in Europe it holds here as well so yeah you have these kind of nests, um, the muskrat lodge, the pile of reeds. You have the potential to use, uh, if they have to absolutely have to, peninsula type arrangements. You have actual islands. And if you have a nice big island like this, um, the geese tend to be less defensive with each other and you'll have kind of a community full of nests. In fact, 
on these large islands, you might find that more than one goose deposits eggs in a nest. I've found nests with upward of 20 eggs inside of them, where typically the average number that I find is five to seven eggs in a nest. Um, I think generally a nest can have anywhere from one to 13 eggs if it's laid by a single goose, but um, far more often the number is somewhere around five to seven, and then you get a big island, island like this, you might have as many as 20 eggs in a nest um, that have obviously been laid by several geese, um, but are being incubated, I'm assuming by one. That's an assumption though. I haven't actually studied to find out whether multiple geese will um, incubate those nests that have multiple gooses' eggs in them. Um, a lot of times a goose will choose something that looks islandish. <laughs> something that sticks out from the surrounding territory. Um, this is a, a, up by the front tire of this bike. Uh, you'll see, see a nest with one egg in it. This bike was embedded in um, a sandbar in the middle of the river. So it's an island on an island, in a sense. Um, geese will use the anchors the, uh, of uh, bridges this is the high-level bridge, uh, the railroad trestle in Lethbridge, and a goose couple is using uh, one of the concrete anchors as a nesting site. And unfortunately, this is a terrible choice of a nesting site um, because there's no nesting material. I mean, it's a great island for sure, but uh, the mother goose will pull her down out to try to use a down as a nesting material. Um, but as soon as we get a big wind, that nesting material blows away. Now the blood that you see spattered here has nothing to do with the eggs themselves per se, I mean, except that it was caused when the mother laid the eggs. And she may be a first time mother, um, this, this goose, which, uh, or she just may have had problems with laying her eggs, I don't know, but certainly she was, she was losing some blood. Um, in the process, and one of those eggs is cracked from landing on the concrete. Uh, if we were, you know, good human beings in this ecological system, we would recognize that the geese are going to use the concrete anchors of our bridges as islands, and we would put some kind of material on top in this season for them so that they could be successful in their, in their uh, nesting on those islands just my own personal perspective. Occasionally, you will get a goose who is nesting in a uh, tree, uh, using often an old hawk nest, um, like this one. This was a Swanson's hawk's nest. Um, you, you might get geese uh, very high up in the uh, in the forests, um, in the trees, near a water source. Now this tree is right next to Spopikimi. It's part of the floodland or floodplain uh, forest. It's a big cottonwood, and it's a Swanson's nest that this goose took over. And the year that this happened, um, she actually incubated almost a term. We were like a day away, and we had that biggest windstorm and it blew over this nest and all but one a hatchling um, were killed uh, but one survived I call that one miracle and uh, in the moon to come let's see Kapisaki some the frog moon I'll tell you about the adoption of miracle because a lot of times when a goose has just one gosling um, that kind of puts the gosling in danger. The gosling does, you know, is, is in less danger if it's with a group of other goslings. And so uh, in the event that there's just one or two, sometimes you'll have, oftentimes I, I think you'll have an adoption scenario um, where, where that single gosling goes to live with another family. All right, so before they're actually incubating, 
um, if you want to find nests, you have to know uh, kind of what to look for. I mean, one of the signs, like I showed you, geese laying low, geese being extremely aggressive, you can kind of use the hot-cold method um, to find egg caches when the geese are very aggressive. But geese personalities vary quite a bit, even among the same species as Canada, Canada geese, Opspini. Um, there's one goose couple at Spopikimi at the pond that is famously aggressive, uh, and I'll show you them in a, in a moment. But there's others uh, who will back off completely off of their eggs. And um, so one of the keys to nest survival is, is how well the, the caches are hidden. Um, this is an egg cache on a uh, sandbar island amongst some willows uh, on the river. Right almost dead center in the picture, you can see kind of leaves piled up um, that just look like leaves that have fallen off of the willows if you're not looking carefully. But if you have an eye for it, you can see that this is actually a circular pile of leaves that's a little bit odd, just a little bit odd. And that circular pile of leaves is hiding, concealing, a cache of eggs. When you dig in, there's some eggs. Um, so this is, you know, an egg cache may look like this. It may be more like a round disk of uh, clipped grass. So it's going to be something, though being used, whatever the surrounding material is, if, if there is surrounding material, to conceal the eggs as they're being cached. And the, and the parents will not st st stick right over top of them most of the time. Like I say, and there are ultra-aggressive couples who will defend their egg caches um, quite strongly. And the technique that I use when I go out to collect eggs is, uh, first of all, I want to get them during this period when they're being cached. Because once a goose is sitting on a nest, um, the incubation goes pretty quick. I mean, we're talking one lunar cycle, so 28 days of incubation from a single cell to a gosling. And so that's pretty quick. So things are changing in there rapidly every day. If you're several days into incubation, you're going to open that egg. It's going to be kind of a bloody mess. Um, now, in the past, People might not have minded so much that there's a little blood in there. It's not that big a deal. But today, people like clean eggs. And um, when Adrian and I would serve these at our beaver bundle ceremonies, um, they have to be clean. They have to be. Uh, people are squeamish enough knowing that they're eating wild flower, <laughs> fowl eggs. Um, if they open one up and there's development, they would get, you know, they wouldn't eat it and it would be a waste. So, um, so I make sure to get them when they're being cached. Another good reason to do this is that it's more ecologically sound to take them when they're being cached, um, because there's an opportunity for the goose to replenish the egg. Now she lays an egg about one a day, a little bit more than one a day, and she's not going to sit on these eggs until she's got her full clutch. Now that full clutch is flexible. You say if say her full clutch is going to be five eggs and you come along and you take one, she might replenish it and have her full five eggs. But if you come along and take three, she might not replenish it all the way. She might end up laying one more egg and sitting on three eggs, this kind of a thing. Um, she's not just going to continue to produce eggs and produce eggs. She's got to start sitting on them. Um, because the timing is important, as I already said, for the flood. So that's programmed into her genetically. Um, she's going to start incubating those eggs pretty quick. So I try to get them during this cash, caching period. And um, in order to do that, you have to know the timing. You have to know the sites where the, where the nests are going to be. You have to know how to um, look for those caches, how, how, you know, how they look, 
so you can notice them even though they're so well hidden and camouflaged and then um, yeah you can collect some eggs I never take every egg out of a nest and if I come to a cache and there's only one egg in there I don't take it I leave that egg and this is just a general protocol with traditional foods you never take the only one of anything even if you know there's going to be more nests around if there's just one egg in the nest leave it because more eggs are going to follow if I come up across this nest and there were this cache and there was just these four eggs in there I might take two I probably take one but I might take two I definitely wouldn't take three um, I go a little more beyond the official protocol because um, I want the goose to have a nest I want her to sit nest so that there are more geese in the future so I'm not going to take a lot I'm going to put the the onus of the work is going to be on me to find more caches in order to collect more eggs and you only got a brief window of time to do this with these geese um, the next in line will be the mallards, Mixagutsi, but the geese are first. And so you, you have about a week or so to focus on the geese, um, seven, ten days or so, go out there and harvest uh, from their egg caches. And depending on the sites that you choose to harvest, you can end up with a lot of eggs. Um, one of the things about these eggs when they're being cached like this is that they have a an invisible film on the egg and that just comes as it's being laid there's a film on the egg that film makes it impermeable to the air to the surrounding air and when she's when the goose is going to actually sit on the eggs like when it's like this this is a this is a nest that's being incubated these eggs have been licked clean of that film now the oxygen can get in and this is part of what's needed in the in the development of the egg so before that it has that invisible membrane and um, if you collect it with that invisible membrane and you just take it and you put it in a cool spot you can keep it for months you don't have to put it in the refrigerator per se um, and don't put it out in the sun but if you keep it in a cool cool spot then it'll it'll stay a good egg for a while and if you want to make it stay even longer take some grease or take some oil and rub it over the surface of the egg and it'll make sure that everything stays air impermeable and as long as it's air impermeable that egg will stay good for for months um, Adrian and I have had eggs still good for eating in December that we picked around Easter um, that was with oiling and with refrigeration but even without the technologies if you just put it away it'll last a few months once it's like this it won't last even if you even if you harvest it and it's just she's just been sitting on it a couple of days um, things are underway in there you can kind of halt the progression of those things. Uh, one of the techniques that I'll use is I'll freeze the egg. Um, in fact, I'm just, just experimenting with that technique this year, but it's working. I've, I've already seen it. It's working. Um, if you freeze the egg just as it is, the egg cracks because things expand in there and it cracks, but it still stays frozen. It doesn't leak all over the place. Um, and so it's fine. When you want to use it, you just thaw it out and use it. Um, but yeah, if you get it like, if you get an egg that's just being sat on, you gotta know, okay, one thing is she's not going to replenish her egg. And then, um, so you're just taking, and then the other thing is you got to eat it right away because it's not going to stay good. Okay. Some of the geese will allow you to get very close while they're sitting on nests. Um and others will <clears throat> will not let you get this close um, some will be aggressive some won't this mother was one of the ones at the pond who was year after year allowing me to get very close to her um, 
a lot of times you'll just find the, the mother goose sitting there and her gander will be off somewhere else. I mean, probably within the sight. Sometimes not even within the sight. That's a bad husband. But the best ganders stick right by their goose's side. And in this image, um, you probably can't see it too well, but there's a gander standing on a little island watching over his goose who's incubating a nest right beside him on this other island, this flotilla of old beaver food. This is a good, a good husband standing by his wife. Um, the couple that really trained Mahoney and I, Adrian, in the phenology um, was, well, this was the goose of that couple. And she was very defensive. She has an egg cache here, and she's standing right over top of it. And she's going to lay down her life before she lets us take any eggs from her cache. And we never have taken any eggs from her cache. We've always just been there to watch her family develop over the summer in the years when she succeeded. So she's very defensive. This is her husband. Her husband is on the spot. He's the toughest one, toughest gander on the whole pond. You can see his nose is all roughed up. Um, it's one of the ways I identify him every year. Another way to identify geese as individuals is by that white chin that they have. Each one has a little bit of different shape to it. I don't know if you can if we can go back and look at look at his look at the shape of his chin, his white coloration. Look at hers. You see that sharp angle on hers at the top? See everyone's a little bit different. And you can get to recognize individual geese by looking at those white spots. You don't have to tag them or that kind of thing. You can just come to recognize them as individuals by their unique features, the same way we recognize humans. Uh, my own personal feeling is that it's a laziness to tag birds. Um, it's a laziness to come up with a with a better, not to come up with a better system uh, that's less intrusive on them. Um, any case, he's a tough guy. He, uh, like his wife, is going to lay down his life uh, for the eggs. This is him. That's her beh behind him. They have an egg cache. There's no way I'm getting to it. They're going to fight it out. And I see him fighting, I don't know, dozens, dozens and dozens of fights um, during, the, during the nesting period um, with other geese and with other animals. Uh, certain birds, like even if they're on an island, they're still susceptible to predation by certain birds and other geese. And so he will absolutely tear after any other geese, goose. And he got to know us so well that he would actually sometimes chase other ge geese toward us so that they would have a double panic, that they got him behind them and they got us in front of them. And he would kind of use us uh, to, to uh, psychologically get the better of some of the other geese on the pond and keep them away from his nest. Very effective, uh, strong fighter, this one. And he has to be, because as I said, there's predators. There's coyotes, there's weasels. Um, I don't know if muskrats would even bother it with it. I kind of doubt it. Uh, but there's skunks, there's raccoons, there's you know various carnivores um, and omnivores, mammals um, in the floodplains. But then there's also the avian species. And one of the ones we see a lot here who come in right around the time the nests are, the eggs are being laid, uh, who return here from the ocean, are the ring bill gulls, Kai. And they just have the black ring on their gull, on, the, on their beak. Um, Kai is a generic Blackfoot word for all gulls. It's kind of like how in English everybody just says seagull. In Blackfoot, they say Kai, but of course, there's many different types of gulls, and so there may have been more specific names for these in Blackfoot in the past. Uh, but what we're left with today is Kai until we come up with some new names. 
So this is Guy, and Guy loves to eat waterfowl eggs. Um, that's his main feast when he comes back here, uh, aside from trash and stuff <laughs> that we leave out. I think this one might be eating part of a bagel or something in a parking lot near my home. But yeah, they're all over the place where the where the nests are, are happening. And a lot of times you'll find nests that have been assaulted by the kai, um, eggs that have been opened up, that kind of thing. You also have this scenario, um, which I don't see as often as the kai, but you might have a pelican um, coming around snooping at the eggs. And here you have a gander giving chase to a pelican um, while his wife sits steadfast on her nesting island. In Blackfoot, these American white pelicans are called Aisipisa, uh, which refers to the to how they've got their um, looks like there's water in their in their pouch under their mouth. And um, we usually see their return during this moon. I'm surprised I haven't seen them return yet, but I expect them any day. Uh, tonight I'm supposed to meet some students down at the pond. I wouldn't be surprised if there's Aisipisa down there already, but we'll see. Very pterodactyl looking bird, and I've never known these birds to be represented in any Blackfoot bundles, although um, that may just be part of the tradition, the culture that has been um, lost through colonization. And we may still be able to get gifts uh, returned from these birds today uh, if we pay attention to them. Another one that I've never seen actually go after a goose nest, but I wouldn't doubt if it would, would be Mohgami, the the great blue heron. Um, great blue herons return around the same time as the geese are starting their, their nesting. Um, typically, what a great blue heron is made to do, you can see they got their long legs. Um, that's so that they can wade in the water and their legs look like the stems of reeds uh, to passing fish. And so they can just move very slowly or even stay still and um, catch fish up with their beak. Um, but I do, I have known them to open up baby turtles and the shells of baby turtles. And uh, so I wouldn't also be surprised if I had ever found one um, opening up an egg. Although I'm, I'm, I shouldn't be uh, talking about them as such a suspect uh, until I've seen them, but it's just a possibility that I'm putting out there. Uh, ones that aren't possibilities but are certainties are magpies and crows and ravens. Um, we have all three here uh, in Blackfoot territory, and all three of them uh, will feast on eggs if they can. And they are very, very observant. The corvids are um, highly aware of everything in their environment. And you better believe a lot of eggs are lost to the corvids. In terms of what I've seen over the last eight years or so watching these birds, I would say uh, 80 to 90% of the nests, of the goose nests, get destroyed by predators. Maybe maybe 10 to 20 percent, depending on the area, um, will succeed to full term to, to have goslings. And that just opens up another era of danger once you're a gosling. But um, yeah, I would say 80 to 90 percent of the nests that I watch get destroyed by predators somewhere along the period from the time they're being cached to the time they're being incubated, to the time they're goslings. So, and that will be, I think, the end of part one of uh, Sa'aki Sam. I'm going to come back in and talk about the other 
um, waterfowl that we'll see returning during this moon cycle in part two.